Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Growth Leap. I'm your host, Michel Gagnon. We talk to pretty awesome business builders who are designing disruptive and meaningful companies. Today, we deep dive into how LinkedIn develops products and innovates. Our guest left the Germany a few years ago to work for some of the top tech companies in Silicon Valley. Christian Biza is Principal Product Manager in Mail and Premium Messaging at LinkedIn. He's also co-founder of the OMR Festival, one of the world's largest events for digital marketing and technology. I hope you enjoy our conversation on product development, innovation, and building meaningful events. Welcome to the show. Really happy to have you here in an early morning in San Francisco, correct? Yeah, thank you so much. It's 8 a.m. It's actually not too bad. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. It's not too bad. Depends on who, who I'm talking to, but uh, I'm <laughs> glad that it, it fit your schedule. So uh, Christian, you are a principal product manager in mail and premium messaging at LinkedIn. I'd like to start with where you are right now. You joined the company about a month before it was acquired by Microsoft. Can you tell us a bit about your role and how you your experience has been going so far? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I actually started at LinkedIn in a different position. So I was first responsible for the German market. Um, since I am German, they were searching for someone that speaks German, is a product manager, lives in the Bay Area. So maybe there were not as many people, but thankfully they found me and and I was able to work on that market. And we had a lot of challenges in the beginning because simply no one like really thought about that as international expansion for those markets as much. And so we really focused and fixed uh, lots of standardization problems and like premium pricing and like features that are specifically interesting for the German market. But then about a year ago, I really wanted to do something that has more of a kind of a global scale, right? Um, because if you only focus on one market, you also have to go there a lot. And I have a two-year-old, so I didn't want to travel as much anymore. And then there was this question of what is the next big opportunity for me within LinkedIn? I also, you know, checked around outside, but really thought LinkedIn is a great place to work for me. I'm very mission and vision driven. And we always talk about that we want to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And this is simply something that excites me. And when I thought then about the overall product landscape at LinkedIn, um, I was thinking, what is really important, right? Like, what is something that has lots of visibility within the company? What is like important for every line of business? And if you think about what we have, right, we have recruiters that talk to people. We have salespeople that talk to people. We have just like podcast hosts that reach out to people to find interesting candidates. And so what do they do? They message each other at some point. And there was this great opportunity that no one really thought about in mail, like the messaging between non-connections on LinkedIn for quite some time. And that that role opened up and I was able to take that role. And now since yeah, a year, I'm working on in mail and other premium features for yeah, our premium members within the messaging ecosystem. And I could literally be not more excited because I always say behind every opportunity is an in mail. And that's really true if you think about it, because you know every line of business, they need to send messages at some point. And so that kind of goes through my team and through me uh, on the product side. And it just is really great, you know, because other roles, you're very focused on one specific problem. And here I need to think about talent solutions and sales solutions and marketing solutions and all premium members and how they communicate. And just simply one of the most important pieces, right? Like, that people get together, talk to each other and create this opportunity. And that's something that motivates me every day. Can you tell us a bit about how product development works at LinkedIn? I am myself involved in uh, ad tech company, so I have my own experiences. But I'm curious, how does product development works at LinkedIn? And how does that differ maybe from your previous experiences? Yeah, sure. So before I worked at Adobe in product management as well. And so I do have some comparison, of course. Also, I work at OMR, which is a conference and trade show and digital brand in Germany. Yes. And we have product teams everywhere. And so or, or there were product teams in all of these steps in, in my work life. And so it's interesting to compare these. On LinkedIn specifically, like probably most companies these days, we have a very agile like structure. So we have about 200 product managers, and each one of those has somewhere between 10, 15 engineers. And, you know, then it's kind of really led to the team of how they want to structure, but most of them follow some kind of agile process. So we have two week sprints in my team, for example, 
And then we do all these things that you would do in like that agile software development with sprint planning and a retro perspective in the end. And, and then we do this kind of in a quarterly cadence planning wise. And especially when you work in a big company like LinkedIn, you have all these dependencies, right? Like you can't just play in, in like your own little world where you build whatever you want, but there's a lot of collaboration necessary, of course, because so many teams work like together, especially in my role where I work with all these different lines of businesses, I have to figure out how do I get the stuff that I want also on other people's roadmaps. And we have this pretty nice process it's called depend in. So we always like to combine the in from LinkedIn with uh, words. So depend, depending tickets, basically. Marketing so, everywhere, right? Yeah, <laughs> in, in a sense, <laughs> something to it. Yeah, but you basically tell in advance before the planning starts, what do you want to do? That affects other teams and you need to also get the funding from those other teams. And of course, that also slows you down in some sense, but it is uh, something that, that works really well because it's managed for you also. So there are like technical program management teams that make sure that this cross correlation collaboration works really well. And, and it's not just simply filing a ticket, right? I mean, if you want to do something across the organization, you have to like, uh, in German, we say Klinkenputzen, actually, <laughs> what is the word in English, where you kind of walk from door to door and you touch every door handle, which is uh, seems very gross in Corona times. But, <laughs> uh, but but that's kind of what you have to do, right? Like, I have to set up meetings with the PMs before and, like, we have these principles. A lot of stakeholder management. Right? Yeah, exactly. And we, at LinkedIn, we have these different principles within the company. One of them is relationship matters. And this is really what it comes down to. Like, you have to have the relationship across the organization to kind of like advertise for your product of what you want to do. And then the next quarter, you kind of hand in your dependent ticket. And then you kind of start the work once the funding is there. But it's definitely something that takes some time, right? At the scale that we operate at, what is it, like 15,000 employees, things just take some time a little bit longer. But when we then invest into something and come together, we can also accomplish pretty cool things, right? Because that's why I am also so excited working at LinkedIn. We touch so many millions of people every single day, right? Like when we do changes, they can really help every member of the global workforce to keep it in our language, basically. So uh, it's really exciting. Yeah, that's obviously um, one of the things sometimes we discuss with our audiences uh, and our audience is made of startup founders, scale-up leaders. And, uh, you know, as you grow, obviously there's also that challenge of, you know, when you're a startup, you, you can be funky, disruptive, you can change uh, your mind every two minutes if you want. But as you start onboarding more team members, you need to become a bit more disciplined in how you do things. Because once you decide to go in one direction, you first have to make sure that everybody knows what that direction is. And if you want to change course, uh, you, um, you know, it requires a bit more time and coordination. So I totally understand. Yep. If we stay on this topic, we talk, I'm interested about, because I, I also have a, a career in, corporate in the corporate world uh in bigger organizations and i know exactly what you mean by stakeholder management and making sure everybody's aligned how do you reconcile that and this is a challenge that all big organizations have how do you reconcile let's say the desire to be innovative and to have your entrepreneurs come up with crazy ideas with this process which is you know a bit heavier obviously than if you were a five people team yeah so we actually do have quite a few mechanisms in place that also encourage innovation. So for example, we have this process, which is like a product or strategy review, mm -hmm. where every PM in the company pretty much, and usually goes through PMs because those are the ones that think about those things. But we have the opportunity to come up with something ourselves and put this into like a structured document and then hopefully have some design support to have some early mockups and whatnot, but at least have something like drawn on paper or something and then and then go to our exec our executive product teams and pitch that idea to them and i went through this quite a few times it always feels like you pitch for an investment in a sense mm -hmm. like a startup and it's highly encouraged and most of the innovation within linkedin actually happens through this process like a lot of products that we have today are built because one product manager thought oh i really want like an events product, for example, within LinkedIn. Yes, of course, there was lots of demand from the outside. And everyone was like, why is there no events product yet? But then it was really up to the product teams to pitch that idea and come up with that product and then get the funding and then eventually build it. And I think I like this process of 
a structured uh, document. So there's like kind of a template that you have to fill because you know this happens quite a lot. And then if you, you are an exec and you see this every week, you want to have it in kind of a digestible form. And yeah, it, it, I think it works actually pretty well because a lot of innovation came out of that at LinkedIn. So it's a bit like you're a startup within a big tech company. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, not every team, of course, right? Like, of course. But everyone has the opportunity. And even for my current role, like this in my uh, position, when I initially took it a year ago, there was no engineering team. There was no design. There was literally just the idea of my boss that said, hey, I really think we should do something here. But Christian, if you take this role, you have to come up with a strategy. You have to pitch for the funding. You have to convince people that this is something that we should really do. And then if you are successful, you get the team. And that's what we did, right? Like I started the the job the first three, four months. I didn't have any team. I would just go around and we have these in days or so once a month at LinkedIn. We have a day where you, you can do something with a team, not necessarily something for your actual job. But when we were in the office, you could we would do hikes together or we would do like some fun project. But what I love most is actually hackathons. Uh, and so we would organize these hackathons. And so in the first three months, every month, I would like just grab a few guys and girls and just convince them that we should build a little thing uh, <laughs> on that day. And that way, I kind of figured out who is as motivated to do stuff like I am uh, from the engineering team. And then I kind of pitched them the ideas as well. And then they actually asked their managers, hey, Christian is doing this new thing around InMail and the premium stuff. Uh, we would love to be in that team and then kind of did it that way. But through this process of trying to figure out who are the most motivated engineers in the beginning, I was able to then grasp a team and then we and then we did the strategy review and then we got the official funding and only like six, seven months after I initially started the role, I then also had the people in the team officially that I was able to work with. Uh, and so this happens all the time. And I think it's it's actually really exciting because then you can also test is someone really behind this is someone really motivated to push those things forward. Great. I got two follow-up questions on this. The, the first one is, if we go back to your specific job and, and the project that you, or the product that you're leading, you know, people receive so much marketing and sales outreach these days. As the person in charge of being mail at LinkedIn, how do you make sure that a great outreach feature for someone uh, does not end up becoming an annoyance for the person at the other end? Yeah, I totally realized. I mean, that's why this team was also started, right? Yeah. Um, uh, because we all realize uh, that, you know, there are certain challenges and um, a bunch of things you can do. So as a member, I have very easy tools to just report things, right? Like A, there's, like especially on the feed also, there are ways where we have automated understanding of the content that isn't great but also members with just a few clicks always have the opportunity to report something as inappropriate yeah. so when it get, goes into like really kind of the spammy world but specifically within messaging i for example started a team i call this inmail health and it's across all lines of businesses where we work together and i don't want to be the aol or the yahoo messages i always make that joke you know because <laughs> if you think back like 10 years People were on AOL, as uh, in the US at least, yep. and they did not, at some point they were like, ah, this is like only spam, I'm not using it anymore. And then they went to Yahoo and then, oh, this is only spam, I, I don't use it anymore. Now they're all on Gmail or now Hey or yep. whatever other messaging platform uh, pops up. So I really think about this a lot and we are working on solutions. So for example, just recently we, we built a feature where we auto-archive messages like sponsored messages after 30 days. So they just simply disappear from your inbox. I mean, mm -hmm. they're still in the archive, but they, they, you know, when you come to your inbox, it's not full of just ads. And so, and then there's this, we call them magnets, uh, people that receive a lot of messages. And probably you and me are in that bucket as well, right? Like you receive constantly outreach from recruiters and from other other folks. There, you, there's always this fine line because it's also about opportunity, right? Like every yeah. of those messengers could be the next opportunity for you. And do you want to sort every recruiter message into some folder and get it out of sight? Maybe we have to build something in, in that area where like really strong magnets have that opportunity. But yeah, you can be assured that I'm thinking about that problem a lot because we want to create this healthy messaging ecosystem, right? Where people use the inbox and don't feel like this is a place where they only receive something that they don't want to see, but that 
they have like very high quality conversations that they are also used to what they see on the feed, for example. Another thing I'm interested in is uh, about targets or uh, how do you decide what you develop next and how do you measure success within your team? Mm -hmm. So generally, the company has true North metrics, right? Like the, the leadership kind of decides of what the company strives for. And then it breaks down about or into every team about how that metric breaks down for them. And so you can have a different true north for your team than what the company has, as long as it contributes in some sense. Mm -hmm. And so in my team, for example, we think a lot about retention and like what makes people happy that they use the product, that they don't quit the product, meaning from a premium perspective, right? And so we have targets around that. And then, of course, when retention goes up, also premium revenue goes up. Uh, and so those are metrics that I, for example, care uh, a lot about. Um, and then how that works is that we have uh, a BizOps partner. So I always call them like my internal McKinsey consultants <laughs> that help me to set up these targets and size uh, opportunities and features that we want to build based on the expected impact and then prioritize a lot based on, on that impact. And yeah, they, they, they really helped me to, you know, figure that part out. Yeah. I think that's kind of the essence, you know, we have a BizOps partner, you have like the overall company targets, and then it kind of tickles down to each individual team. And, and then we sign up for targets for each quarter. And there's also a yearly target, but you know, usually for each quarter. And then we, we measure like almost every day, right? Like every day there's an email and sends you your metrics every Experiment that you run gives you the insights into how you move these metrics on a weekly level. We report those numbers up and we can then discuss it within the leadership for your specific team. So, for example, within messaging, we look at all the messaging metrics. And so, yeah, LinkedIn is a very data driven company, probably like any other larger tech player here as well. Yeah. And, and following up on this, um, Whenever you design something new, um, if, if you think about design sprint or about the lean startup type of, of approach, usually what you will recommend to a founder is come up with a, an idea, an MVP, or at least a, a sketch of what you want to do and try to test it in front of somebody as soon as possible before you start building something. Um, yeah. Can you do this or how do you do this oh, yeah. with users? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, for example, I just went through this. So we call this vision sprints as well, where... Um, you, we start with a kind of a tiger team within the team. So you get a designer and a product manager and maybe one of the engineers who is interested in this as well. And we start with like the how might we, yeah. you know, like how might we do this and then how might we solve that problem. And then before even writing a PID, we sketch things out. Uh, and then uh, and I have awesome designers that then build prototypes and we kind of then discuss those again, right? Without even writing a PID or like long documents, it's mm -hmm. really just like these are our user problems and how might we fix them? And then we package that all up into like a vision document. And we just went through this for my team. And so now I have this vision of where I want to be in two years. And then we take a bunch of those features out of that vision and then we can build them step by step. And then we only write the like detailed product requirements we go into like the really detailed specking on the design side but having something that is already like a overall mock-up simplifies me also explaining why we need this to other teams right like this relationship yeah. stakeholder management thing if you have like a nice little mock-up already and uh, it's much easier to explain uh, rather than you know just using words because you know humans are simply very visual uh, <laughs> animals so yeah. uh, it helps a lot but can you also, do you also test that with uh, better, oh, yeah. better users? Oh, or, yeah. yeah? So, sorry, yeah, I, I totally forgot about this. So part of that vision sprinting is then that we also do like these rapid labs. So we, uh, so just with the features that we just went through in the design process, we, we then have like a research team and we had a bunch of member cords immediately. And one thing is the member cords, but the, the, the other one is also listening, right? Like, we have a team that simply, or with the messaging, we have a person that does nothing else than just figuring out what do people say online, what tickets come in, like on Twitter, on, on other social platforms where people request certain features. Um, most product managers at LinkedIn are also very heavily involved in those conversations where we just respond directly and we encourage to respond directly to 
these members. And I, I do this quite a lot. Like whenever I have a, a problem that I want to solve, I also go on Twitter or on LinkedIn and search for people that requested these. And then I reach out to them and say, hey, I saw that you requested this feature. Can we talk about it? And I had many good, great conversations just through that. And that makes fans, right? Like if you respond from a product side to those requests, people are extremely happy. And we are, of course, very happy as well. But it's just, you know, it's a it's a great way of like finding out what to do. Yes. And maybe just to finish on on this specifically, what have you learned uh, in product development in your career or what are you using? Think think maybe tools, but also methodologies that is quite effective and that you could apply on a smaller scale. Let's say if you're in a, you know, in a smaller startup or scale up. Yeah. So I think that really what I just described with checking what people do online and reaching out to them, right? yeah. I don't have to work on at LinkedIn to reach out to people. I mean, that's the beauty of the network that yeah. it's accessible for everyone. And if you see someone on Twitter talking about some idea, sending them a message on LinkedIn, like every time people are like, wow, you like check on Twitter and then you you talk to me here on LinkedIn. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could also message them on Twitter, but, but <laughs> since I'm the PM for emails, of course, I use them in <laughs> email for that. But it's just a great way of just, you know, if someone took the effort to tell their opinion why not reach out to them, right? Mm -hmm. And the and, and same applies for like reviews. If people review your products, um, especially reviews become so important nowadays. Interact with people that review, like message them afterwards and you have the opportunity, right? Like yes, on Google, for example, if people review you there, it's maybe a little bit harder because there's no professional identity behind um, what, uh, what, what was reviewed, but still you can answer. Maybe people then respond. And so there are ways to just, get that user insight almost for free because again like people that took the effort to fill out something and to to write something somewhere or to talk about it they're probably very willing to also continue that conversation yeah, yeah. great i just want to change a uh, subject a little bit uh, because you're a, you're a man of many lives in 2011 you co-founded in germany omr which is uh, stands for online marketing rock stars which has become a must attend uh, festival and in, 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 in Europe and many other things. Uh, I'm really interested to learn a bit about the story of the, the creation of, of OMR. What, what's the story behind that? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the many lives thing. I, you know, it's, it actually comes with a benefit if you live in a different time zone, because then you can also work in different time zones. Yes. And so you have the ability to work on different things. Um, which I was frankly the only way how, how it was possible for me to do these things uh, like in parallel. But yeah, we started this in 2011. Um, actually my three co-founders, so we, there are four of us, they, uh, started two other companies before Philip Wessermeyer, Christian Müller and Tobias Schlotke. And then they, they also started this, you know, little event. Like then we called it online marketing rock stars. Literally in the university it was like 200 people. And uh, I just came to Hamburg back or back to Hamburg after studying in Cologne and I started in digital marketing and I, I always organized things like in high school, I organized LAN parties with a couple of hundred people and we played Counter-Strike. I never actually played Counter-Strike, but I, I loved like bringing people together and like creating the network and seeing the value that comes out of something when you are the one that organizes it. And it's actually I know, ironic that I work at LinkedIn today because it kind of is like a like a red line through my life. And then uh, during during university, I would organize these little mini conferences and also got like lots of benefits and mentors and whatnot through that. And so when I then started in digital marketing, I was like, okay, I don't know really anyone in this industry, but I love to organize things. Why don't I also start an event? And then I met Philip, our CEO, uh, through a common friend and he was like yeah i just started this organizing this event don't you want to like join that and uh, and then we yeah then we started and then the second year we had this like this goal of like, okay let's make hundred thousand euros in revenue and i remember how we were sitting at hatari in hamburg it's like a little restaurant in the schanze and philip said let's make hundred thousand euros in revenue and i was like oh my god this is so much money and it is, of course, a lot of money, but it is like coming from you know, organizing LAN parties and like the little university things where you have a couple of hundred of a budget. It just seemed to me some like very aspirational target. But true enough, we, we made to like to nail that target. And at that point, I was like, OK, Mike, you, you can really like do something with this. Like you can bring 
people together and and reinvent how those events are made right like you, we we also looked at the industry and thought okay all these other events out there you know it's not it's like you know you go into some hotel lobby and then there are these like tables with this white <laughs> like blanket yeah. like around and there's these little water bottles uh, that that like is always the same feeling and didn't feel like timely for the industry that we were in so we always thought okay Wherever we go, we want great food, we want great atmosphere, we want great music. Why can't we combine that with content that you want to learn about? And I think that's, you know, how we also picked our venue, right? Like the, the second year we were in a club in Große Freie 36, which is like a, a music club that the Beatles used to play mm -hmm. back in the days. And I remember the smell when we got in, into the venue at like 5 a.m. in the morning <laughs> to set things up because the party just stopped. So there was still like all the like cigarettes and alcohol uh, smell in it. And so we have to clean everything. And yeah, you know, that's kind of how it started where we brought people together and then we threw music acts on stage and we had always like a big focus on great food. And then after a few years, when I had the opportunity to move to the US, I then made that decision to say, yes, I want to move to the US because, you know, how often do you have the chance to work or to get that offer to get relocated for an American company and get the visa and everything paid for? But I continue to, to work remotely. So I've been actually in the, my home office, if you think about it, since since eight years um, <laughs> for OMR. And it always worked really well. And then at that point, we started to hire people. Uh, and at that point, we also uh, scaled the company much more because we realized how valuable it is to create a trade show as well next to the conference itself. Because if you have a trade show, you have exhibitors, and then these exhibitors become your marketers because those guys invite people to the event as well and we continue to put a lot of focus on the experience and how everything looks like right like most trade shows even though today i mean of course not today because of corona but trade shows that you go to today most of them they just book like an empty big hall and then they put booths in there and then they turn on the lights on the ceiling and it's not like the greatest experience and then they most of the times have food that is also not the greatest experience and so we always really thought about how do we make that better? How do we create like a light and sound acoustic situation in a big like, conference hall that makes people want to be there and not like thinking about, oh my God, I have a headache. I need to get out of this. Um, and so, yeah, over time, this grew and grew and grew. And now, yeah, we have more than 100 people at the company. And yeah, this year, of course, is very challenging for us as for everyone else, because obviously there was no festival. And we're still like figuring things out for the years to come. But generally, it was a really exciting ride for me so far because we literally grew something from like zero to, you know, one of the largest events in that space, probably like not even Europe, like even worldwide. I don't know of a, a different like founders driven event in that space. You have, of course, Hills for Streamforce or Google IO, like these kind of corporate run events. Uh, that might be bigger, but just from a pure like digital marketing event space, I don't know of a larger event than OMR actually. So yeah, I'm I'm very proud and excited to be part of that journey. Yeah, well, congrats because it's a a remarkable feat, and everybody talks about. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm based in Berlin, so OMR is uh, very very well known. Talking about scaling, uh, I'm really interested maybe to dig deeper on this. Starting from scratch is tough and not everybody can do it. Uh, not, you know, you, you require a certain type of personality or drive, but scaling is also challenging. As you, you know, scale OMR with your, your partners, you know, what, what have you learned or what are the things that you would have done differently? Yeah. I saw scale wise, what I, what I just mentioned, the, the event itself, I think really scaled when we like expanded from content conference only to this networking thing of how do you connect companies to people right like i mean that's the essence of every trade show that you have exhibitors and that you have people that come and then they want to do some business together mm -hmm. but i think that was for us the way how we initially scaled from like a 3000 people event where it was mostly about great speakers and like i'm just going there sitting listening and then i may be talking in the break with some friends to okay this is a place where business is made and so we scaled from 3000 to 16000 people in one year and i think that's where it made like click for us that this trade show idea is something that can 
bring us to that next level. Uh, so that, that was certainly one of the most uh, important uh, decisions in, uh, initially. And I think the other one is then that uh, traditional trade shows and these kind of events, they happen once a year, every two years for a couple of days. And then the rest of the year, you don't hear or see anything of it. Yeah. Right? Like even in traditional industries like IAA, like the car show, or mm -hmm. even when CBIT was still a thing, right? Like CBIT happened. I don't know if it happened every year, but that was it. And then afterwards, you didn't hear anything. And so we, from the beginning on, uh, that was actually the first hire. We thought about like, how can we be present with our brand the entire year round? Yeah. Rather than just like, how do we have these contact points so that the festival becomes more like, a, okay, all the friends come together as like a family, family <laughs> meeting almost once a year. Mm -hmm. And so we started the blog initially. We had the jobs platform very early on. And then I think very smart from Philip was to start the podcast, the OMR podcast, because that literally put the OMR brand into so many people's heads mm -hmm. every week yep. or multiple times every week. And then the podcast, at the podcast, we realized the potential and then started to produce other podcasts. And now we are probably, yeah, Germany's, if not Europe's largest uh, podcast network, where with Podstars, so our sub brand for podcasts, uh, have the ability to. You know, offer companies and partners to book like advertising across all of these uh, different podcasts that we manage, but also produce a lot of podcasts for our partners you know, or, or in partnership. And so I think, yeah, like what, what were key decisions to so the trade show, the podcasting business, the content across the year or every line of business that we have at OMAS, we have like executive education and we have the, yeah, the, the podcasting and We have these reports that we come out with once a month, like very deep dive topics about certain, you know, digital marketing things. All of those put our brand into people's heads yep. every day, every week uh, again. And I think those were for us the critical decision moments that um, brought probably the brand to where it is today. And, you know, talking about the, the pandemic, you also mentioned, I think a bit earlier, that some people were asking about LinkedIn event features stuff like this where do you see the future of events at least in 2021 yeah it's a good question i mean it's obviously something that i um i think a lot about i mean we hope that if at some point it goes back to normal right yeah. like once we have a vaccine or at least some medication to treat it you can bring people together again and generally i think people realize that They can do business also just online. You don't have to get into a plane to fly somewhere to make a deal. Yeah. But I think what you can't replicate is this experience, especially what we do at OMR, right? Like the the mix between of great content, great food, great people, great music, inspiration. Because if you just sit in, in your home office and not everyone has a home office that is inspirational or, you know, like most people probably sit in some dark corner of the room in front of their laptop. Like I, I, I highly question if that is something where, or if that's a place where innovation and, and like great things will happen. And so you need these like stimulus opportunities in your life. And so I really believe that we will come back to some sense of normal. Uh, 2021, probably we will have limitations, but, you know, especially OMR is always like, too packed <laughs> almost <laughs> like we always had the benefit that we were always sold out literally every every event that we did so far or every festival we had to close the doors at some point and that probably might not be possible yet like big concerts that we have right like Deichkind or or Materia or like all these like mostly German big bands uh, that play like when when you know when you throw something like this into your agenda That is probably still an issue next year. So we have to see. We still plan, but uh, we have to see what uh, the, the situation will be. Obviously, there are all online events uh, like solutions now. And LinkedIn, of course, is doing some sense there as well. I just don't believe that you can replicate everything. You yeah. know, you can replicate like digital content learning pieces. And we just ran a big online masterclass session with more than 60 different tracks. And a couple of thousand people attended that uh, two weeks ago at OMR. So those things can be very successful online. And we're also thinking, uh, or we are building right now, a reviews, like a software review platform, because that's what a trade show is about, right? Like you come to buy a product, but then there are these tools out there where you kind of walk like a VR, AR thing through some trade show to have some conversation. I, I just don't believe that that's how things 
work mm -hmm. at least yet. Yeah. But uh, what people still need is like, if I'm the CMO of some company, I need to buy some software. I need to figure out like which one is the best one. And so I used to go maybe to Omar to the trade show and work from booth to booth and get informed. And so we are now replicating that experience in this online review product. So OMR reviews is currently in the making where you have that opportunity to read about certain softwares and read the reviews from, from other professionals in that industry and to get a better understanding of what is you, your exact, you know, or what, what software solves your need. And yeah, I think in the end, you have to destruct, deconstruct your product offering to figure out what of those can be offered online and what of those maybe cannot offer online. And then that's at least what we did at OMR. We, we focus on those that are indeed able to, to be replicated. Great. I think I also agree after having spent quite a few months working from home, I think you still once in a while need a, you know, human connection and you need to, to experience a real experience. And, um, you know, there's uh, quite, let's say the OMR parties have a uh, quite a reputation and I don't think you could as you said replicate that uh, virtually so uh, hopefully yeah. we'll be able to uh, see each other um, again in the near future um, yeah yeah hopefully I, I want to talk about a bit your international experience I'm a Canadian living in Berlin so I've as you said we both of us have jumped across the pond but uh, in different directions After you used to work for Efficient Frontier, which was uh, acquired by Adobe, they asked you to join the product team in uh, HQ, which brought you to the West Coast. I'm just mm -hmm. interested, how has been, you've, you've been there for what, eight years, more or less, in the US? Yeah, almost, almost eight years, yeah. How, how has been your experience so far? Yeah, so I kind of alluded to it quickly already that this opportunity came around the corner, right? Yeah. And, you know, how often is it that someone offers you to move across the pond and I'm highly respectful of everyone that just do, does that like just by themselves. Like I want to uh, move to the US and I figure out my visa and I figure out yeah. employment and all of these things. And then you get here and you may not have someone that picks you up from the airport. You don't have an apartment yet. And so it was funny because there are these TV shows in Germany. I don't know if you know the, the Auswanderer. So the like, what is it actually translated? So it's a show where it's about people that move abroad mm -hmm. And I remember that one of our friends from university, so my wife and I, we both studied in Cologne. And one of our friends worked actually at that TV show. And when they heard that we are moving abroad, they were like, oh, can you be on that TV show? And so we can have like a like a story about this. And the funny thing was that we... Um, We didn't do it because, uh, you know, it's just a little bit too much effort, I guess. But in hindsight, maybe it would have been funny because it was one of those stories where everything was taken care of for you, right? Like, yeah. so they picked us up at home. They packed our clothes and our stuff. We got picked up here at the airport. We got to a furnished apartment in the beginning. And even the fridge was filled with food. Wow. And so moving across the the world was made so much like easier probably than what most you know people experience and so i'm deeply grateful for all of this you know the next day someone picked us up and drove us around the city and showed us apartments and it was literally like like moving on steroids it was it was amazing and yeah uh, ever since You know, we thought, oh, yeah, oh, that's what we t told our parents, uh, at least. You know, we stay there for like two, three years and then we come back. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then eight years you later, know, you realize, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You realize the opportunity, the mindset of people around you, you know, this this great mix of talent that comes together in the Bay Area, um, the uh, amazing weather that we have like all year round. And then, of course, the opportunity work-wise of what companies are based here and what, what you can work on. So, yeah, then, you know, you buy a house and you get a baby and then you suddenly think, okay, maybe we stay here for a much longer time. At least that's right now the plan. And I'm interested to talk about the the work culture, business culture. A few years back in Hanover, I attended CBIT, which you've mentioned a bit earlier. And there was a panel discussing what Germany could do to create a Silicon Valley. Anybody who's worked both in the U.S. and Germany can easily tell how different the cultures are uh, beyond the, let's say, the usual stereotypes. What have you observed in uh, Silicon Valley that you feel is maybe the secret ingredient to to driving innovation and growth? So, as so to be honest, especially since COVID, many things also become more similar. Uh, and also, we only cook with water here. But I think the Silicon Valley just has a few key things that 
made them be ahead of others, right? So A, I think this really early focus on high education, so on like bringing really talented people here, mm -hmm. have the, having the best schools in the world is probably one big contributor. And then there are simply just a few generations ahead, right? Like, like 30, 40 years ago, the first semiconductor companies <laughs> made like uh, huge exits and made a lot of money. And so they were able to fund new uh, companies and new startups. And so this ecosystem is just now there for many generations. You know, you talk about this PayPal mafia where Elon Musk or Reed Hoffman and, and other people came out of that founded then other companies. Mm -hmm. I just feel that the Silicon Valley is just like a couple of years or like a couple of decades ahead. So it's a little bit hard to point out specific ingredients, but what it then in the end comes down to is, you know, do you have great people that come together to work on awesome stuff? And yes, you have this in Berlin as well. Like, I mean, you are a Canadian living in Berlin, so something sparked the interest of in you to move there. And I always think when I go to Berlin, I have a very similar experience to what I see here. It's just that things here operate probably at a different scale. Like the money that people raise is just a different level. And then the valuations that they get very quickly is a different level. The the go-to-market strategies that American companies uh, have maybe is uh, is just a little bit different. And then that creates just a very special environment that you can, then it's like kind of this, this circle, right? Like, or, or the spiral effect that, you know, you have a few talents here and then more talents come and then they tell they are friends that are great and they come. And so you just have like the best of the best people that come here. And that's probably more so the case than in, in other places of the world. Um, but again, I, I think whenever I go to Berlin and I used to go there a lot when I was working for Germany for LinkedIn, I have the feeling we have something very similar already. It's just that we are a couple of decades ahead and that's hard to replicate because it simply just takes time. Mm -hmm. And you've recently launched a podcast entitled the OMR Silicon Valley Update, uh, in which you interview Germans who've made it in the valley. Based on your own experience and, and that of those that you've interviewed, what's one of the key, I don't know, skills or personality traits that you feel is required to succeed in San Francisco? Yeah. So I, I talked about this with many people. And I think what it comes down to is that people have this certain fire or drive in them, right? Like everyone you meet here has like a special story to tell somehow. <laughs> and it takes some energy. I mean, I was lucky because I was kind of asked, ah, so you want to move here? Yeah, why not? <laughs> and then we we came here and uh, and then things went from there. But most people you meet here have something special. Like they, you know, like the other week I interviewed the founder of Kite, which is like a rental car company um, that kind of reinvent this rental car business place. And he was, or he holds the Guinness world record on driving on a bike on one wheel. And it's just completely <laughs> random. But everyone has these little stories to tell or my, one of my best friends here he builds like a new uh, financial system for the developed world based on cryptocurrency. Like everyone has these like like very special talents and very special, everyone has this fire burning in them. Yeah. And I think also that's the only way how you can succeed because simply the rent is so expensive and like generally life is very expensive. If you don't have this fire and if you don't like, give full power and if you don't really strive for that, it's simply really hard to survive in this city. And thankfully, you know, the salaries of most companies are, are like at that level where you can also survive. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's really what I see in, in every podcast guest that I had so far that people have just this, like they're like a different species almost <laughs> <laughs> where, 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 you know, they, they just, yeah, extremely talented, extremely passionate, extremely like hardworking as well. And then with the ecosystem around them and the investment levels that you get, they're just able to accomplish pretty awesome things. And as you said, you know, it's a bit of a magnet for talent and, and entrepreneurs and, and money. So uh, obviously, as you said, if you want to be able to thrive, you have to have that hunger and yep. that drive. One of the things we also talk about, uh, either on our blog or in the podcast, is um, not burning out. Especially when you scale up a company, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. You have just too many things on the plate. You're full-time LinkedIn. Uh, you work with OMR, you have a podcast, you have a wife and a kid. 
and you live in the valley where you said things are moving pretty fast. How do you stay sane? Yeah, maybe I somehow belong also to this species. <laughs> it just it generates energy from doing a lot of things. Yeah, I think it helps that the weather is always great here, it, which is funny. I remember the times back in Hamburg where like in February, March, at some point where you had like six months of like bad weather behind yeah. you already. You literally have to, you know, I don't know, go to, I, I actually, I remember that we went to these, actually, I don't even know the word because they don't exist here. Like these things where you go into and then it, you get tanned. What is it called? Like this. This, oh, uh, like a tanning salon or something like that? Yeah, the tanning salon, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to a tanning salon once in my life back then because we felt so depressed from like the grayness <laughs> around us that we needed this warm kind of feeling. And so I went with my wife back then, which was, was really, really funny. But he literally, I mean, he's always bright here, right? Like the sky is almost mostly always blue. And that gives me lots of energy that I can, you know, go outside the door and I, I run a lot and I road bike a lot. And then... I think that helps me a lot. And then simply the people around you, right? Like, as I said, like, everyone that is here is has this, like, special tenant or, like, special aspiration. And that motivates you as well. And, yeah, so for me, this, like, burning out thing or getting overworked simply never happened because, you know things that come together in such a great way mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you, you generate energy of, all of that stress if you will but yeah no of course it's something that i'm very fortunate about probably that i generate energy from stress from working because i work on things that are just very exciting for me are you working on your own uh, guinness record <laughs> no no uh, no i have no aspirations on that uh, no I, right now really I, i try to get listeners to my podcast and uh, get really <laughs> exciting and it's just amazing right you know the people here like there are so many germans here in the bay area that accomplish such great things and now that i started the podcast a few weeks ago i get people reaching out to me now already and say hey i have this the story to tell and they're just such crazy people i never even heard about that yeah. have amazing stories to tell and that's for me one of the biggest inspirations of all of them so far because i now have to i have the opportunity to talk to those people that i never even imagined talking to mm -hmm. so that that helps me a lot yeah, it's a bit like when you buy a blue bikes and you start seeing blue bikes everywhere right so yeah now you start yeah, talking yeah, to yeah, germans yeah. and they, they start popping up great um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ta talking about the uh, the podcast and you as a whole what, what's next for you for the omr for the podcast so yeah i mean the podcast I just started, right? Episode four just came out. So there's lots of work to be done uh, and lots of people to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to each one of those. And you do this uh, in German, right? Yeah, it's actually in German. Okay. Most episodes. And I was like super lucky. The second episode was actually in English. So okay. for your audience, it might be interesting as well. Uh, some people rather speak in English because they live here for such a long time. Yep. And that was with Zooks. And Zooks just got acquired last week for one point. 2 billion, I think, from Amazon. And, you know, having someone that works at Zooks in such a great position, and then, the, like, two weeks later, they get acquired by Amazon. You know, those those are stories that I want to tell. <laughs> yeah. It would, would have been amazing to, to have the... Yeah, I, I mean, it would have been amazing to have a comment on that even, but it was simply before it. But, but um, yeah, next there is just get the greatest minds uh, on it and, and, and talk about it. Um, otherwise, I kind of alluded to it already that we work on this review platform right now mm -hmm. and i'm really excited about that where's the best way to follow you uh, christian yeah i think linkedin <laughs> that was natural <laughs> good answer um, so yeah 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 <laughs> you can find me there um of course i'm also on instagram and and you know and, uh, yeah, but then yeah most and foremost of course i'm interested in like people talking to me about the podcast and giving me feedback about it and it's actually really hard for me because i used to be the one as a product manager you talk a lot you like convince other people you do storytelling you um kind of drive something forward and as a podcast host you are completely on this other end right like you ask the questions you have to go through like a structured interview and so for me that is actually huge learning mm -hmm. uh, that i can also adapt to my my work life and so yeah that's it's an interesting challenge for me well thank you so much we wish you all the best uh, thanks for spending time with us this early morning for you and uh, hopefully yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll see you soon uh Maybe at the OMR. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm always there when it happens next year, hopefully. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye.
Thanks everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. As usual, you can find the show notes at stunena.com. Also, quick reminder, we've launched an online course called Growth Leap, Design Your Startup for High Performance and Impact. You can learn more at academy.stunena.com. Thanks a lot and see you soon.